Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I am the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. On Tuesdays and Fridays this week, we will continue with our fireside chats. On Tuesdays, Pastor Tim and I will bring you more about the life of the church, and Pastor Ron on Fridays will continue his series in the Beatitudes. On Wednesdays, we will continue with the virtual prayer meeting and the TFC virtual meeting as well. Discipleship groups will also continue to meet virtually. If you'd have a question about a discipleship group or a question about anything in general with the life of the church, please contact the church office and uh, ask for one of your pastors. Allow this to be a reminder to remove any distractions so we can worship our great God. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can worship you. Lord, allow us to share these words from David that were the call to worship. Lord, allow us to bless you at all times. Allow praise to continually be in our mouths. Lord, humble our hearts, humble our minds. Give us ears to listen from your word. Lord, allow our worship to be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. Let's read God's word together. We will be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. As you're turning there in your own Bibles, uh, you may recognize that this is a different passage than where we were last week. Last week, we started a new series, The Permanent Prevailing Church, and we looked in the book of Matthew. The rest of our series will take us through the first two chapters of the book of Acts. So I invite you to join in reading along as I read the first 11 verses of Acts. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We are so thankful we are thankful people because of, of what you have done and, and what you have done in calling us to yourself, that through the sacrifice of Jesus, you have made a way for sinners to be made clean. We recognize that, that we are those sinners who needed to be made clean. Not only were we sinners, but Lord, we still sin. And so we stand always in need of your grace, always in need of a savior. And so we thank you for the Lord Jesus, that when he did come and, and die, that he rose again and then ascended to your throne in heaven. Lord, we, we hear this story and we are reminded, 
we are reminded of, of who you are. You are this great God who has authority over all things, that you are above time and, and outside of your creation, that you are in control. We thank you and praise you for that fact. We thank you especially because as we look around at the world today, Lord, we see so much chaos. We see so many unknowns and, and we have to face the fact that, that we are not in control. And so we praise you that you are in control, that you are the God of all things and that you are the same yesterday and today and forever. And so the love that you, that you poured out by, by sending your son is the love that you still have for your people today. Lord, we thank you so much for this. We pray, Lord, as, as your people, we pray for, for those who are around us. There are so many needs that we can look to. There are so many things that are going on that we can pray about. We see the, the pain. We see the confusion and, and discomfort that is going on in our world because of the COVID-19 virus. Lord, we see people in our congregation who are, who are sick. We see those who, who have had to be in the hospital or those who are shut-ins. Lord, there are so many people who stand in need of prayer. So we pray that you would come and you would comfort your people. We also pray that for those who do not believe in you, we pray, Lord, that salvation would come to them, that they would realize in this time that, that they are not in control and that only you are in control. Lord, we do pray these many things, even, even as we read about from your word and, and hear about the witness that went forth the testimony of your word going forth in, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Lord, we pray that, that your word would continue to go forth in this time. We think at this time, especially of our missionaries, those that we support that go around the world. We have many missionaries and, and there are many different countries, some here in this, in this country, but others throughout the world. And they are all experiencing this, this unique situation at the same time. We pray, Lord, that you would give opportunity for your people to share the hope of the gospel with those they come in contact with. But Lord, we know that that mission is not limited to those missionaries that have been called out, but that it belongs to everyone in the church. So we pray that you would help us as a church to be faithful, to share the hope of the gospel, to be ready to give a defense for why we have this strong hope the sure and steadfast anchor of our soul that is Jesus Christ. Help us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. While we're not together, we do gather around the Word of God, and we count on the presence and the help of our faithful God. So join me with prayer in, in prayer now, would you please? Father God, what a privilege we have to know that you have revealed yourself through your word and we get to study it together and we get to receive it and then we get to do it. What a privilege it is. But it also comes with a responsibility, Lord, and we ask that you would help us to take that responsibility very seriously as your children, to not just be hearers of the word, but to do what it says. And Lord, I pray that you would be with me this morning, that you would give me power from on high and that you would guard the preacher so the preacher only preaches the words of God that you have given me. So I ask this, Lord, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I do invite you to open your Bibles to the first chapter of Acts. You will remember that last week we were not in Acts. We were in Matthew 16, verse 18, where we heard Jesus say, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates shall not prevail against it. These words, are, we're using them to introduce a new series that we are calling the permanent prevailing church. And what Jesus says really does have a ring of permanency uh, as, as well as victory to it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that our Lord Jesus is building. The church, as long as it is faithful to its builder and founder, will not fail because our Lord Jesus is uncompromisingly committed to his church and his power and his purposes accompany his church. Now that, that should encourage us in both senses of the word encouragement. 
It should put a, a spring into our step. It should remind us to keep plodding along in what Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. We, we don't give up on the church, even though the church as an entity and the sinners who make up the church will sometimes disappoint us. We, we don't give up on the church because it's not the pastor's church. It's not the elder's church or the deacon's church. It's not a particular family's church. It's not a church that belongs to a particular age group or social class. No, it is the Lord's church. And he has promised to build it, and he is building it. And he will not abandon it. But the second meaning of the word encouragement is that we are to be prodded. It, it should encourage us always to be checking ourselves as individuals and as members and as leaders in this church. How are we supporting the church? What are we contributing to the faithfulness of the church and its commitment to the truths of the gospel and to the Jesus who serves as its chief cornerstone and builder? Are we contributors or are we detractors? So this series on the permanent prevailing church is going to take us to the first two chapters of a book that bears the title, The Acts of the Apostles, but I can assure you that this is a book that deserves and demands a more accurate title. For if the church was founded and grew on the basis of the acts or works of a few select men called apostles, then we who are part of the church are always going to struggle in our involvement because it's only the super gifted or the super called or the super talented who direct and guide and bear responsibility for the church. But, but that's not the way it really works. On the other hand, if the success and vitality of the church are instead the proprietorship of Jesus, who in his grace and compassion gives us the privilege of being part of the church and serving as stewards and caretakers of his church, then that's going to motivate us. It's going to motivate us to commit ourselves to this work that he will carry out and carry on and carry to its, to its conclusion. So would you look with me? I know we've already read the first 11 verses of Acts 1, but I'd like to read the, read the first five verses of Acts chapter 1 together. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was take, when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, we look at these first five verses and we see that they clearly serve as an introduction. They establish the fact that this is, in fact, a sequel. That is given to us right at the start. It's in verse 1 where we read, In the first book, O Theophilus, this is the second book. The uh, first book has already been written, and both are addressed to someone named Theophilus. Now, where have we seen that name before? Well, we've seen it before in Luke 1, verses 1 through 4, and we read from that book, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. The fact that both books are addressed to Theophilus tells us that they have a common author. And that author is identified in the book of Acts certainly as Luke, the beloved physician who was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. We're going to see, if you read past the first two chapters, there will be times when we, when we see Luke's involvement in this adventure. There are times when the pronouns in, in parts of the book that describe Paul's travels, they change from they to we. That's a sign that Luke is now present with Paul. But as we compare the opening verses of Luke to these first verses in Acts, I hope we're going to notice something that is of gargantuan importance. This is huge. 
If you keep a finger in Acts and look back at Luke 1, you, we read that Luke's purpose for his gospel, I've already read it to you, was to write an orderly account so that Theophilus may have certainty concerning the things he had been taught. And Luke then writes this detailed account about Jesus. He starts with the story of his birth. He tells of the cross and of the resurrection. And then he concludes the gospel of Luke with Jesus' ascension into heaven. That is where the, the gospel of Luke ends. It ends with these words from Luke 24. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now we can read that and, and, and we may think as Acts begins that the ministry of Jesus is drawing to a conclusion. He is about to ascend into heaven to the Father's right hand. This is the moment of Jesus' exaltation. And once he ascends, and we're going to see a more detailed account of that, Lord willing, next week, well, then the establishment of the church is left to the apostles. And what we read in Acts is their exciting exploits, starting largely with Peter, but by the time we get to Acts 13, Paul takes center stage and he remains center stage for the remainder of the book. So we might read this and get to thinking that, okay, Jesus' ministry is ended, the ministry of the apostles starts, and it's really based about a few, on a few very talented, very gifted, very called men. But Luke here immediately corrects us on this. Yes, Peter and Paul and a few others do occupy much of Luke's second book. And yes, the title that is given to the book is the Acts of the Apostles. But then we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and see how Luke opens his second book. He writes, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. Do you see? Luke's gospel is all about Jesus, what he began to do and teach. And the book of Acts is, and Luke's telling us right from the start, it's the story of all that Jesus continued to do and teach. And when does that end? It continues even to our day. It's where we get the strength to be the church that Jesus is building and using in our world. So we see immediately that Luke and Acts are not two separate projects with this dividing line called the ascension that shows where Jesus ends his work and then the work of the church begins. Jesus accomplishes the mission of redemption and then departs. So the church is a project that largely rests on the strengths and weaknesses of its founders. No! What Luke is telling us right from the start is that both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, they're parts of the same work. Acts is the ongoing ministry, the story of the ongoing ministry of Jesus. And here in his introduction to this ongoing work of the Lord Jesus Christ, Luke is doing a few things for us. First, he looks back. Then he looks forward. And in the process of both looking back and forward, he explains why looking to Jesus matters for us as we seek to be a faithful church. Looking back all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Luke begins his second book with a number of references to things that he has already written about in his gospel, starting with the person to whom he is writing, Theophilus. Theophilus means lover of God, but who is he? Well, in Luke 1, he is referred to as most excellent Theophilus. That seems to be a title. It's a title that's applied later in the book of Acts to two Roman officials, Felix and Festus. If it is a title, and I believe it very likely could be, then it's likely that Theophilus is also a Roman official of some sort. And one of two possibilities seems to be likely true about him. First, possibility. 
that he's already come to trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior, but he is what we would probably today call a baby Christian. And it certainly wouldn't have been easy for him to be a Christian and a Roman official at a time when Christians were just beginning to be looked at with concern and distrust. So, so Luke writes both accounts to give to add to Theophilus' certainty. That's the first possibility. And the second is fairly close to it. The other possibility is that he is what we would call a God-fearer, and he's very curious about the Christian faith. He is drawn to it, but he's not yet come to the point where he's sure and he has received Jesus as his Savior. Now, in either case, Theophilus is in good company, isn't he? For we live, live at a time when it's not as easy to be a public Christian as it used to be, when the culture was at least nominally pro-Jesus and where there was at least an outward cultural respect for Christ and his people. That's the way it used to be, but that, this is no longer the case. But at the same time, that leaves us many opportunities as Christian believers. I can't help but think of this current pandemic as a, it's a door of opportunity for us to be like Luke to see when the door is open, even a crack, and then to patiently explain who Jesus really is, correcting misconceptions that people have about him, and offering real hope in a world that is feel, filled with fear and anxiety and the sneaking suspicion that there's no purpose at all to this life we live. Many people are there, and this is a window of opportunity for us to explain the hope that we have that serves as an anchor for our souls. Now, the same painstaking detail that Luke provided for Theophilus in his gospel, in all that Jesus began to do and teach, is also going to be applied here in Acts. But before Luke can move on to cover some new territory, he first reviews what he's already written about. And if you look throughout these first five verses, you see a skeleton framework of many of the highlights of Jesus' life and ministry. So go ahead, take the time to look, to study yourself. It's okay not to look at the guy who's on the screen. Look at your Bibles. What do you see? What do you notice? Well, Luke picks up exactly where he leaves off with Jesus' ascension. He's going to give us a little bit of a different viewpoint from what he gave in his gospel, starting in verse 6, and Lord willing, we'll come to it next week. But he, even here in verses 1 and 2, he provides a dividing line between these two books. The gospel, again, provides all that Jesus began to do and teach, but then that part of the saga ends with until the day when he was taken up. And then the next chapter begins, the chapter that we know as Acts. But what is in, included in all that Jesus began to do and teach? Well, in, in the economy of just a few words, Luke reviews so many things for us. He tells us the start of Jesus' ministry. He refers to his teaching. He tells us about his death. He refers to his resurrection. This is an encapsulated view of, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 Luke writes, for John baptized with water. Who's John? John the Baptist, John the baptizer. At the start of his ministry, Jesus came to John to be baptized, not because he had any sins that needed to be washed away, but to fulfill all righteousness. If John baptized as he did, he baptized people as an act of repentance for sin, Jesus allowed himself to be baptized, not because he had any sins that he needed to repent of, but so that he could identify with the people whose sins he would bear on the cross. That is the start of Jesus' public ministry. Next, we see that much of that ministry involves teaching. And we see that here too, don't we, in verse 3. We know that after his resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days among his disciples and others. He wasn't with them all the time, but he would appear time and again. And the New Testament records at least 10 instances where the resurrected Jesus appeared to people. You can probably read, you can read most of them, not, not a complete list in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 and 8, and, and go to the end of all the other Gospels, and you can see different examples of Jesus appearing. Now, what's Jesus doing during these 40 days? 
Well, it seems that the fact that he appeared but he wasn't with his followers continually means that he was preparing them for a time when he would leave them for the rest of their lives here on earth. But we also see, and it's here, that one of the things he's doing is giving them a bit of a refresher course. That's what we see in verse 3 when it says that Jesus was speaking about the kingdom of God. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus teaching about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is here. It's already present because Jesus is the king, but it has not yet arrived in its fullness. That's what Jesus taught before he rose from the dead. I like that Philip Ryken says, it's not surprising then as we come to the book of Acts and we have these last moments of his earthly ministry as Jesus presents presents himself as risen Savior and Lord, he is speaking to them about the kingdom of God of all the things. Dr. Ryken says that he could have addressed with them. This is the most important for them and for us. Finally, this look back by Luke to all that Jesus began to do and teach includes two central foci, the cross and the empty tomb. That's found also in verse 3. To them, that is the apostles whom Jesus had chosen, verse 2, to them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs. Where do you see the cross there? It's presented very simply as after his suffering. And the resurrection is he presented himself alive. Jesus was dead. And then he wasn't. And this is a fact attested by many proofs. What what proofs? All the eyewitnesses, including 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, over 500 people at one time. This is a proof that Jesus was raised from the grave. But I would say it's even more than that. The proofs include such things as Jesus showing that he's been raised bodily by the fact that he ate with his disciples by the fact that he let his disciples touch him. He's not a phantom. This is a real person who has been visibly, physically, bodily raised from the dead. My friends, our our hope and our purpose as a church is anchored in these truths about Jesus that Luke is referring us to by way of reminder in these first few verses. The church of Jesus Christ is solidly anchored on real proofs about him. Before Jesus left, he is essentially saying, these are things you need to know and to remember. And as you bring them to mind, you will be strengthened for the work I am giving you. Looking ahead, waiting for what Jesus will continue to do. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus tells his disciples not to leave Jerusalem, for it is from Jerusalem that the ongoing ministry of the Lord Jesus will be inaugurated inaugurated. Jerusalem ought to bring to our minds many things in terms of redemptive history. Jerusalem is the city of David, the great king, but even David pointed forward to a greater king who is yet to come. Jerusalem is the city where Jesus enters as a triumphant king, where Jesus goes to a cruel cross, and it's also where Jesus is raised from a cold tomb. So much of the Bible's salvation story is focused on Jerusalem, but there is yet one more great event in the story that is to happen in Jerusalem. So Jesus tells his apostles to wait. I don't know about you, I am not very good at waiting. I am impatient. I do not like joys and good things to be deferred. I want them now. But good things indeed come to those who wait. And for the apostles, While it's clear from the verses that follow that they are still pretty clueless about awaits them, at least they have what Jesus has already told them to help them with the waiting. 
Waiting is made more bearable by promises. Don't you find that to be true? We can look forward with hope, even to our deaths. For our Lord Jesus has promised us unimaginably good things for all of eternity. And so even as we wait, we wait with confidence saying, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Now, Jesus told his disciples that they were to wait for the promise of the Father. Jesus' Father, who they also have the right to call them their Father, as we had the right to call God our Father. Well, Jesus' Father has promised something that he is sure to deliver. What had Jesus told them about what was to come? Again, Luke kind of hints back and takes us back to his gospel, which he, he takes them back to something that Jesus had told the disciples just a few days before. We can read of it in Luke 24, verses 46 through 49. Just listen along. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Hear those words and imagine yourself as one of Jesus' apostles. Jesus is reinforcing what he's already told them and how exciting that must have been for them to hear once again, even though they don't know exactly what this is going to look like. What is coming will come to them while they are in Jerusalem. So stay there. Jerusalem is still going to be that place where repentance and forgiveness will continue to be proclaimed in the name of Jesus. But it's not just going to stay in Jerusalem. It's not going to be contained there. It will spread from Jerusalem to all nations. Imagine what else must have tickled the apostles' ears. The promise of the Father is for them. And whatever it is, it will involve power from on high. The apostles have been promised by no less than God the Father a power that will clothe them. They'll be clothed with power from on high. It will clothe them and enable them to somehow be active agents in the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And those things are going to come in the name of Jesus, their risen, reigning Lord and King. They will take the things that they have witnessed concerning Jesus, the things that they saw him do and teach and those things will go out from these men, starting in Jerusalem, but later spreading to all nations. How exciting that must have been. And all this will happen, Jesus is saying here, when they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we're reminded here, as they must have heard it, that day is coming not many days from now. So now what about the Holy Spirit? Were these men unfamiliar with the Spirit? No. They had seen the Spirit at work in their Messiah on many, many occasions, strengthening him, empowering him. And by this point, these men are true Christian believers. They personally experience the Spirit's presence in their lives, just as every Christian does. But see, with this promise of the Father, and this presence of the Holy Spirit is going to come a commissioning and a power that goes with it. John tells us about this just again a few days earlier in John 20, verses 21 and 22. It's what Jesus told his disciples right after he'd been raised. He declares to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then John writes that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So yes, they, they know the Spirit, but they're going to know him in a new and exciting way when the promise of the Father is given to them and they're clothed with power from the Spirit. So the apostles take what Jesus tells them in these opening verses, and if you peek ahead to Acts 2, verse 1, they are indeed waiting. They're waiting in one place, in Jerusalem and at Pentecost, they are clothed with power from the Holy Spirit. And what a power he gives to them.
looking to Jesus, what our Lord is doing in and for the church. Take this reminder of what Jesus has already done and what is about to come, and what do we have? We don't have two books that are only loosely connected, but we have one ongoing story. We have the Gospel of Luke, which is the story of all that Jesus began to do and teach. And we have Acts, the story of what Jesus continues to do and teach through the Spirit. And so this book is inadequately named. I'm not asking you to cross it out in your Bibles, but the Acts of the Apostles really probably should be titled The Ongoing Acts of the Risen Savior, Jesus Christ, or perhaps, as someone else has suggested, The Acts of the Lord Jesus Christ Through the Apostles in the Power of His Holy Spirit, or even John Stott's suggestion, The Continuing Words and Deeds of Jesus by His Spirit Through His Apostles. Brothers and sisters, if the book of Acts is the continuing words of, and deeds of Jesus by His Spirit, then this is an ongoing work. We're not apostles. They were a unique, limited group of men who had been personal eyewitnesses of the ministry of Jesus and his glorious resurrection. That class is closed, and don't let anybody try to tell you otherwise. But this church is something that Jesus is still building, and it's still his ministry. And he uses even sinners, frail sinners, though we are but dust. He even uses us in this ongoing work. And we do this work empowered by the same Holy Spirit who clothed the apostles with power from on high. You, who do you serve? May I remind you that in this church, not just Grace Bible Fellowship Church, but the church universal, you serve Jesus Christ, the builder of his church. To accomplish the work of the church, he has given us his Holy Spirit. May I say that the Holy Spirit has not retired? His Spirit is still at work in his children, in the church of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that as we do the work of the gospel, the work of the church, we are still an empowered people. The Spirit gives us everything we need, not only to remain true to Jesus and to grow in our faith, but also to proclaim Jesus in Quakertown, our Jerusalem, and to the ends of the earth. So let's go out remembering that, and let's go back to work. Jesus has given us his spirit. Do you know what else he has given us? His word. We go out equipped by both his spirit and his word. And that word is still powerful because it's, it's, it's Jesus' word, it's, it's God's word. Well, we're not going to go through the whole book of Acts. You can read it yourself. And I promise that as you do, you will notice the power that Jesus has given to his word. Let me just quote three instances. Acts 6, 6 verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Acts 12, verse 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Acts 19, verse 20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Now, that word prevail, it ought to ring a bell. Where have we heard that word recently? Oh, right. Matthew 16, verse 18. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Brothers and sisters, let's remember these things. And I close with these words from Kevin DeYoung. Wherever the gospel is preached, there you have Jesus preaching. And wherever they listen to the word, they are listening to Jesus. And whenever a sinner comes in faith and repentance, he's coming in response to the call of Jesus. Jesus Christ is still doing. He is still teaching. People don't need gimmicks. They need more of God. The Spirit of God and the word of God are more than enough to do the work of God. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we are not left as orphans. You've given us 
your spirit, the spirit of Jesus, to convict us, but also to empower us, to supply us with all we need, both to live a life that is pleasing to you, increasingly being conformed to the image of your son, but also it's all, he is all we need to empower us to proclaim your word, to be a church that stands as the salt and light that you have called your church to be. So let us not fear Let us count on the things you have given us so graciously and so completely. This church is the the Lord Jesus' church. It's his church, and he is building it. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for just the privilege of being counted among faithful servants who get to do the work that you have assigned to us and are empowering us to do through your spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, faithful, powerful spirit. Amen. And now hear the benediction. May you go equipped by his grace and surrounded by salvation's walls. Let nothing shake your sure repose, for you have a sure foundation that nothing can shake. That foundation is Christ Jesus. Go in peace. Thank you.